Welcome to the first episode of the Collaboration Podcast. My name is Jonathan Kay, and I am here with my co-host, Marco Massi. We are both members of the Sri Aurobindo Association of America, an organization that produces the Collaboration Journal. The Collaboration Journal is now in its 46th year of publication. It is a journal dedicated to the evolutionary vision of Sri Aurobindo and the mother. Collaboration examines the theory and practice of integral yoga, the place of humankind in the universe, and themes such as consciousness, emergence, and transformation. Articles, essays, poetry, and images explore the human impulse towards perfection and speculate on future possibilities as we move forward in a rapidly changing world. Today, we will be speaking with David Marshak. David Marshak is the author of the books Evolutionary Parenting, then Inviting Youth to Claim the Power of Their Imaginations, a guidebook, then The Common Vision, Parenting and Educating for Wholeness, and finally the book Kid, Kids Need the Same Teacher for More Than One Year. David was the founding president of the Self-Design Graduate Institute and is an emeritus professor at the College of Education at Seattle University. He also recently pu published in the summer 2021 edition of the Collaboration Journal, an article we will be talking about today entitled The Soul's Calling can evolutionary parenting make a difference in the wake of climate change? And we will speak with David about this, uh, his evolutionary parenting paradigm, and eventually also how it relates to integral education. Yeah, so hi, David. Welcome Hello. to our collaboration podcast. Thank you. Good to be here. So the first question, uh, I was thinking about is for those who don't know you, could you say a little bit more uh, about yourself and especially how you did develop your interest in education and how this developed in your life and with how this came into being? Well, um, I've been interested in education um, since the uh, miseducation I experienced myself particularly in high school. And I had a um, pretty, pretty schizophrenic experience in high school in that, not literally, but metaphorically, in that I was a very, very high achiever, um, both academically and in terms of activities. And um, uh, at night, and I'm not gonna admit to any potential specific crimes, I was a juvenile delinquent. Um, I never harmed any people and I never harmed any property that wasn't my own, but I engaged in an array of behaviors that were um, illegal and dangerous. And um, it, it occurred to me eventually, um, I was actually in a bookstore uh, in Greenwich Village when I was 15 or 16, and um, literally Paul Goodman's um, Growing Up Absurd fell off the shelf in front of me. And um, I liked the title, of course. Um, and Paul Goodman really described my life in the sense that the conventional experience of culture in mid-century America um, that was being presented to young people was really abs literally absurd in relation to a life of meaning, a life of purpose, a life of connection, a life of soul. And um, while it didn't change my behavior immediately, um, it did at least give me some grounding into why it was that my life, my own behavior was so disconnected from itself. So, um, you know, I eventually had a lot of different experiences. I, uh, probably too many to talk about, but the one that, that I'll, I'll mention, which I think was a guiding, um, entree for me into my own capacities was, um, I actually did my student teaching. I went to the University of New Hampshire and got a master's in teaching and did my student teaching um, in the New Hampshire State Prison. And in my class, um, I had 20 roughly um, young men who were really incompetent drug dealers because in order to get sent to maximum security prison, uh, it had to be your third conviction, at least, or fourth, 
And so they weren't very good. They weren't very, they weren't any older than I was, you know, they were, we, I was 22, they were 22. Um, they weren't very good at evading the police. Um, and then I had a couple of other folks, uh, actually including one Stalinist, an interesting guy who had tried to blow up the Manchester, New Hampshire police station and a, a brilliant guy who was also 22. Um, but what I learned, I won't go through all the details, but what I learned in that experience was that if I was authentic and honest with these guys, um, I could engage them in learning. And that was a radical awakening for me because um, these were all men, you know, who hated school and who hated learning anything in the context of school because they'd all been treated badly in the school. Um, almost all of them were French Canadian ethnically because that was the underclass in New Hampshire at the time. And basically all of them had abusive um, alcoholic fathers because that was the conventional trope. And, uh, you know, not that every French Canadian was an alcoholic, but, you know, it ran through the culture. And what I found was that if I was not intimidated by them, if I just looked at them as human beings like me, uh, they, they were that, de, you know, that desensitized them to their conventional tropes about authority. And that allowed me to engage with them. So that was really the kind of awakening of my capacity as an educator. Um, and in many ways has guided me ever since, which is the primary um, first step in any kind of relationship in which one wants to teach somebody something is according that person, the full respect of their humanity. And particularly if that's a, if that's a novel experience for these guys, this was a novel experience for them because that was not something um, that they were used to getting. And, you know, even though I was the same age, I was an authority figure for them. Yeah, absolutely. I can relate to this very much, especially when you say that you learned about the fact that you, you should not be intimidated by them. And then this authority uh, figure uh, 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 dwindles, goes away. Yeah? And that it was also my experience as a teacher. I was very intimidated by them, much more they, me, by them than, and, and I didn't have, I had relatively no more, so to speak, uh, school children. So you can, I can, I can even imagine uh, how, how difficult it might have been for you uh, to to go through this but it's it's very interesting i think it's it's also our attitude internal attitude our internal state mm -hmm. that makes a lot a difference uh, in how teaching and learning of course uh, it's uh, yeah there is some subtle force some, some something subtle ha happening there yeah um yeah, and then, at the, at the, I, as I understand it, you much later, probably, I suppose, you were also in India and in Pondicherry, in the ashram and so on. Sure, I'll right? yeah. talk a little more about that. So, um, uh, you know, after that experience, I taught, I taught in a conventional high school for a couple of years and uh, only lasted three years because um, the year after I... Um, taught in the prison, I, I uh, started an alternative high school in New Hampshire with two other folks. And um, essentially with the same clientele that I had in my prison classroom, except instead of being 22 and in prison, um, they were 15, 16, 17, and on their way to prison. Um, and, and again, we had a really um, transformative experience with these, um, I won't call them kids, young people. They were more than kids in many ways. Um, but, it, but we couldn't fund it, you know, beyond one year because we really had no funding source. Um, so I then went and taught in the conventional high school for a couple of years and couldn't, I couldn't really stand the, um, in the two previous teaching experiences, um, I, either alone or I with my colleagues, had control of the um, learning environment with the learners. 
you know, if we wanted to change something, we just did. I mean, in the prison, obviously, there were certain things I couldn't change. We had to stay in the, in the classroom and we only had the time that we had. But in the alternative high school, um, you know, for example, uh, you know, one day we were, we were in this old house in New Hampshire, it was getting cold and the windows were all closed. And, um, you know, it became clear to us that these kids didn't bathe regularly. You could imagine how that became clear. And uh, so we just went and talked to the, they had a, a city municipal pool that was open all winter. And we went and negotiated an hour every week where we could bring our 23 students to go swimming. And then of course, in order to go swimming, they had to take showers to go in the pool. So, you know, you just responded, but in a conventional public high school, you can't respond to anything. You have your, you know, your boxes mm -hmm. and that's the way they are. So I didn't last that long. Um, I went and uh, began a, a doctorate in Boston, and, uh, and in 1979, I had uh, an, an intuitive, it's, it's an ironic story, I, I was about two-thirds done with my dissertation, and one evening I had an intuitive um, hit, um, and it just came to me that, you know, I should study uh, Sri Aurobindo, who actually I'd never heard of. Um, Rudolf Steiner, who I was marginally aware of, and, um, you know, Hazrat Anayat Khan, who I'd never heard of. And so I thought, well, this is really interesting, you know, and it, it had the force, of, you know, of um, a, that it was a, attention, my attention needed to be paid to this in, intuition. Um, so I did, and I discovered, uh, to make a long story <laughs> short, uh, over the next five years, um, I discovered that these three spiritual teachers had each uh, either written or spoken extensively about human development from birth through the age of 21 and um, had essentially laid out uh, a, a paradigm of unfoldment that incorporated the conventional Piagetian and post-Piagetian um, child and adolescent development uh, paradigm that which I had studied in my graduate work, um, but then went beyond that because um, because Sri Aurobindo and and Steiner and Anaya Khan, you know, were engaging in an integral uh, presentation, which was not the case in conventional psychology. You know, they still had these boxes, of course, and um, of course that the three spiritual teachers also not only did they describe the integrality of the different elements of unfoldment in the person, but of course they also described the spiritual dimension and the role of the soul, which of course is not in the Piagetian or post-Piagetian um, psychological. And, you know, after immersing myself in this, um, you know, what I found was that it's, it's, I absolutely believe that it's, you know, they're describing the same reality. This is the reality of the human organism, and there are some variations in the description. This is what I lay out in the Common Vision, um, which is the first book. Um, there's certainly some variations, and there's some complexities in the fact that, um, you know, I don't read German, so, um, you know, I was working with two different translators of Steiner, uh, and Denied Khan, you know, is a Sufi, and Sufi's talking poetry more than in prose, and so there's some translation required. Um, but given that, and given that there's some small differences, um, I absolutely would argue that it's the same description, it's the same potential. And essentially, um, you know, what I later came to see uh, when I was introduced to uh, adult development, adult stage development psychology, which, you know, one of the uh, forms of that um, is, is spiral dynamics, but there are other different ways in which the same stages are described. Um, that what these three teachers are talking about and describing is really a way in which human beings um, can, can evolve, to, can unfold so they can access integral consciousness, um, you know, at 18 or 19 or 20 or 21. Um, and so that's a radically new potential in the sense that 
the, certainly there's some individuals over history and probably I'm sure currently who have had that experience of unfoldment. Um, and Rudolf Steiner obviously was one of them. I don't, I don't know about Sri Aurobindo because I don't know that there are any records of his consciousness when he was 21. Um, there could be, I haven't looked. Um, so, but clearly this is a description of how we can um, maximize the potential for unfoldment for the, and for the evolution of consciousness. Um, and, you know, as I wrote in that article, it would seem to me that that's exactly what we need right now on the planet. And, and it's manifesting. I mean, you know, the more you look around and see what people um, in their late teens and early 20s are doing as activists and cultural leaders, um, you find more and more um, young folks who are actually in accessing integral consciousness and manifesting their activities um, as social leaders from that consciousness. Yeah, this is all really fascinating. And um, I think also I agree, it's, it's really, really important. Um, I, I just got to know your work very recently in this uh, edition of collaboration I have here, the summer 2021, where you mm -hmm. published um, an article called The Soul's Calling. Can evolutionary parenting make a difference in the wake of climate change? And I just thought um, it just jumped out at me as being, you know, probably one of the, the biggest questions of our times, you know, mm -hmm. and I was really, uh, really, um, you know, impressed with that article. And could you just talk a little bit more about what that means, evolutionary parenting and integral parenting? You could mm -hmm. just walk us through your work in these areas. Are you developing these areas? Are these um, areas that already exist in terms of how people are speaking about parenting? Uh, maybe, maybe just give us a little bit more about that. Sure. Um, you know, I really see myself um, as a as a translator. Um, you know, I'm not the author of evolutionary parenting. I'm someone who was called to. Um, you know, take these three quite difficult authors in many ways, um, or difficult in terms of that you really have to be committed to learning their language before you can understand what they're saying. Um, so there's a, a, an issue of translation, and, and my work was really about, uh, I mean, I was led to this discovery. This is not something that I did with my intellect. But I had the capacity to understand these documents after much um, engagement with them. And, you know, one of the ironies about this, which I think also for me underlines the sense of calling, was that I, I was a doctoral student at Harvard at the time and when, and when I had this uh, intuitive hit. And so I started looking for um, publications by these authors. And of course, there are, I think, 11 volumes of Hazrat Anayat Khan, all of his speeches and poetry and, you know, his one book he wrote, they're all collected. Um, and they're in these orange hardbacks, if you've never seen them. So these I found, I found every single one of them in the Harvard Divinity School Library. Uh, you know, um, I went looking, of course, Steiner is much more accessible in many ways in the West. So I found, you know, pretty much everything that had been published in English, written by Steiner and by several of his primary students who had started the Waldorf schools in, in the United States. Um, so they were writing in English. And then there are other folks like MC Richards, who's written about Waldorf education later on in the 60s and 70s. So I found all of these books in the Harvard Library, in the main Harvard Library. Um, and then best of all, I went looking um, for Sri Aurobindo's publications and, uh, and a mother, and I found buried in Widener Library, which is the main library, which has like, you know, eight sub levels and 10 levels and um, somewhere down in the seventh sub level, I think it was a whole enormous shelf of Sri Aurobindo, the mother and um, Sri Aurobindo Ashram publications that had been left there for me. Um, you know, so it was pretty amazing. I mean, I, you know, it was like a wondrous 
discovery, uh, just as an aside to my, my sense of being called to this work. And um, so anyway, the, the gist of it, they're, they're, it, 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 initially it's actually very simple. <laughs> um, humans come with a soul. The soul has knowledge of what it's doing here in this incarnation. And, you know, they're different. I'm not going to get into reincarnation because there are different takes about reincarnation. I know among all three of these spiritual teachers. Um, and I wouldn't say that I ultimately understand this at all. Um, I'd have to go back and reread them, which I haven't done recently. And, but they're all really clear that there is uh, an intelligence um which they call the soul i mean other people call it entelechy you can call it you know different names and so on but the soul knows what it's here for in in this manifestation the complexity of it is that the human organism is infantile at the beginning and so and particularly initially in the first number of years the soul expresses itself through the will and the will is really intensely powerful. And uh, anybody who's parented young children, uh, you know, infants, toddlers, uh, you know, or of course adolescents for that matter, um, know that the will is in some sense, the most powerful expression of the child or youth. And um, so how do you deal with the will? Because, you know, you have to live in the society um, I mean, one of the interesting things about the will is that, you know, in fundamentalist teaching, and whether this is fundamentalist Christian or fundamentalist Jewish or fundamentalist Muslim, fundamentalist Hindu, um, the key parenting teaching is that you to break the will of the child, literally break the will. So the um, common vision, the, the evolutionary is the exact opposite, which is that as much as possible, the parent wants to see the will as an ally, to see the will as a teacher, to organize his or her response to the child that the will is a teacher. Now, it doesn't mean that there aren't moments when you just have to pick up the kid and put her in the car seat and go, even if she doesn't want to. You know, you have to live in this society. There are moments when, you know, but it's not all or nothing. It's a question of gradation to the extent that the parent can create a safe environment for the child that allows the expression of the child's inner teacher, which comes through the will. Um, that's the key initial point. And so what makes this challenging aside from the need for the parent to live in the society and be able to you know, survive and have a good life and take care of business and go shopping, get food or whatever it is that you need to do, go to work. Um, the, the key thing here is that the parent needs to create a safe environment because the will is not about safety. The will wants what it wants and safety is not part of that. So the challenge, even for parents who intellectually understand this, um, who are organized along this way, um, is that the child is always changing. The child's growing and the capacities of the child are always changing. So setting the boundaries is really complex. What's the right boundary? Um, what's the right boundary? You know, I mean, we, when, when children begin to crawl, you know, we put these things in, in the sockets so they don't electrocute themselves. That's pretty simple. Um, for the 16 year old who's gotten a driving license, a car license to drive in the United States, what's the right boundary? These are all complex issues. And this is what I explored in evolutionary parenting, which is the more recent book. Um, where I have interviews with nine different, uh, either single parents or, or pairs of parents. And I ask them all about these questions, you know, like, so what did you do when this happened? And what did you do? How did you deal with this? And, you know, and what the book, what these interviews illustrate um, are really different ways that parents engaged with this. Um, 
and some of the ways that they failed. You know, uh, it's inevitable that there will be failure in, in parenting. So the question is not, you know, are you perfect? You can't be perfect. The question is, you know, uh, most of the time, can you provide an environment where the will can express itself um, and it's safe? So that's really the, the key teaching of the common vision. I mean, it, you know, it, it's a lot more complex than that, but in some ways it's really simple. Um, and I think the key thing, when, you know, I've done a lot of parent workshops and um, I think the most important thing that I've ever offered to parents of young children is this concept of reframing the will. Because if you don't reframe it, the will is a constant pain in the rear because the child always wants to do things and you can't necessarily let her or him do them or you may not want her to him to do them. So reframing the will, seeing the will is the expression of the soul. The soul is the most precious part of your child. The soul is your ally. This kind of reframing um, is just so profoundly helpful to people who are, you know, can get to that point. So beyond that, I mean, I would say, you know, it's all text beyond that. You know, it's all detail. There, there are stages. The stages were described um, by Piagetian, by Piaget and Piagetians. Um, the, obviously, again, the, the complexity of the stages is more complex than the common vision because it includes um, this integral relationship among the domains. Um, you know, if, if you want to see a, a beautiful integral manifestation um, for all of its limitations, which I could go into uh, in terms of the Waldorf School in 2021, um, the Waldorf School in the early years is a beautiful integral expression. Um, the problem is with, is with the content, but that's a different story, you know, and that's the whole, you know, that the content is dated since standard created in 1919 for German kids in 1919, but, but the weaving together of the, the physical body, of the emotions, of the mind and the soul um, is brilliant. I mean, Steiner understood this, you know, he knew how to do it. He knew how it worked. He knew how to weave it together. Um, and, and, you know, it gets more complex with older kids because the, the cultural content the older you get, the cultural content becomes more problematic um, because it does become more academic. So, but that modeling of the integrality is, is um, you know, so for the education part, um, and again, in the families that I interviewed, um, you know, I mean, I don't claim to have a, you know, a scientific sample. I'd have to have hundreds of families and, you know, I didn't have the capacity or the lifetime to do that. Um, but there were really different approaches to education, um, you know, and it also depended on um, most of my families lived in Seattle because that's where I had, I lived at the time and I had access to them. So some of them sent their kids to Waldorf school. Um, there was one great Montessori school in Seattle at the time that was really profoundly integral. Um, you know, one family sent all their kids there. Some of the uh, families um, invited their children to decide at each age what they wanted to do. Um, so, so some of that involved homeschooling, some of that involved going to school um, to see what it was like and make some friends. Um, some of it involved, you know, international travel. Some of it involved uh, parents who were activists and working with their parents, um, you, know, you know, at the age of 10 or 11 or 12 being fully engaged as working on projects and traveling. So there was a whole variety of ways, but each of these families, um, you know, brought that same orientation to some profound extent. You know, it differed, of course, but to some profound extent, um, which is why I included them in the book, because I think they're what, part of what also makes the book work, particularly as a resource for parents, is there's no right way. You know, the key thing is the consciousness that parents bring to their perception of the child. And then it becomes this very personal, very unique um, 
you know, path that um, is also the parents are involved in. And just to say one more thing about that, um, a friend and colleague of mine, Josette Lovemore, who uh, lives in Portland and has worked with her husband, Bob, for 40 years, developing a, kind of a spiritually oriented uh, human development paradigm from their own work. Um, Josette worked, they worked with families a lot directly as, as counselors. And she wanted to document the way in which um, this kind of orientation to parenting is unfolds, not just the child, but the parents as well. The parents unfold. It's a spiritual path for parents. And she has a great book, which I think is called Growing Together. Um, it's it's Lovemore, L-U-V-M-O-U-R. Her first name is Josette, and you can look it up. And so she did a doctoral dissertation where she basically identified some number of families and then followed them over a period, I believe, six or seven years, eight years, and documented not just the growing of the children, but the, un the spiritual unfoldment of the parents. And, um, you know, the people that I know who work in this field, every everybody sees this phenomenon. But to a large extent, you know, we don't engage with people over eight years. So you really need this focused kind of study, which Josette did and demonstrated clearly. Um, so this is a, you know, this is a, the common vision is a path for the, for parenting, but also a path for parents. Yeah, indeed, David, uh, that's all very interesting what you say, because you, it's a patchwork of experiences that you uh, offer us, uh, that you, have, you bring from your life. Uh, I can see somehow the whole picture, but uh, uh, I'm trying to connect the dots because you come up with a lot of anecdotes, which are very, very interesting. And each of these anecdotes uh, uh, merit probably <laughs> a discussion apart. Um, but I don't want to be too uh, uh, precise with the wordings, because I agree with you, by the way, that it is a very simple principle. But when we try, and that's also my experience, when I try to explain these things in words, to people who have no idea what, what uh, we are talking about, then the, the, the sentences, the words explode. But there's sometimes this effect that we, but just to try to be clear, to convey a clear image, because you speak about um, soul, uh, with, uh, which by the, by the way, uh, Sri Aurobindo calls the psychic being. Uh, mm -hmm. And, um, but you entitled your book, Evolutionary Parenting. Why not soul parenting? Uh, wh what is the connection between the soul perspective and the concept of evolution? Mm -hmm. Can you bit, uh, dwell a bit on this? Sure. Um, what, what I wanted to do in this book was speak to parents who already had enough consciousness that this was not new to them. Um, so again, I, the experience that I grew out of when I did, uh, when I was in Seattle, I did um, holistic parenting workshops or soul-based parenting workshops from this work, um, you know, many times, 30 or 40 times over the years. And what I found was, um, the people who came were parents who they already basically knew what I wanted to tell them. You know, they may not have articulated it. Uh, they may not have been, there were parts of it that they were not confirmed in, uh, but it wasn't new. It wasn't a new paradigm. Um, I don't think anybody showed up who, for whom this was a new paradigm. Um, but what was useful to them, there were really three things that were really useful to them. So one was uh, confirmation that they weren't crazy. I mean, that's a little bit hysterical, but really confirmation that their own knowing was confirmed by this authority, in this case, me. Um, so, and by other people who came to the workshop, you know, it was, there was group confirmation because one of the things that people reported 
um, in fact, almost everybody reported that when they parented in this alignment with the soul of the child, um, they had relatives who told them they were spoiling the child. And that was such a common experience. Parents, grandparents, siblings. Um, sometimes there was even a conflict between two parents about it. But mostly it was the, it was the other members of the family and dealing with the condemnation of other members. So, um, you know, that's the reality when you have, you know, families are at different stages of consciousness. Um, you know, I mean, you see that most dramatically manifested, if it manifested in the United States today, you know, with, with people who, um, you know, believe that Trump is a terrible, evil man and people who believe that Trump is a savior who are, you know, in the same biological family. Um, whom I don't, you know, I'm glad I don't have that in my family because I can't imagine how painful that must be. But that's the extreme. But even, um, you know, you know, people who come to parenting with this notion that you have to control the child, which is very common. You know, ch children are wild and you got to control them. It doesn't mean breaking the will. That's the more extreme version. This is the more kind of modernist, you know, you got to control them. And so that was one thing. So I wanted to address that in the book, you know, and say these are, you know, by through the illustration of I had interviews with the parents and then I had interviews with, uh, in every case except one, um, with one of their children who was between the ages of 16 and 25. So the idea was, you know, here's the parenting, here's the product. You know, that's the, the simple version of the book. Um, so that's what I wanted to demonstrate. Secondly, I wanted to demonstrate again that there was no single way. You know, there's no way to do this individually. This is about a personal commitment to the unfoldment of your child's gifts. And if, you know, if you, the good news is that if you engage in this, you get, you unfold your own gifts. Um, I didn't focus on that too much. So then I wanted to relate it to this body of work that's evolved over the last 30 years in adult de um, development, which argues that not only are there stages in child development and development of consciousness, but there are stages in adult development. And we see these stages manifested, um, you know, so, you know, very quickly. So uh, in the United States, and I'm, I'll use the, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not really happy with Steve McIntosh at the moment, but I'll use his terms um, because that, that's what people are most familiar with right now. Um, you know, we see in the United States today that we have a, a big chunk of the population in traditional consciousness um, who are very upset. Many of them are very upset because they believe that they're being um, oppressed and that their values are being destroyed. Um, we have still a plurality of people in modernist consciousness who believe that, you know, we, we really can continue, to a large extent, we can continue living the way we've been living in the last 50. We don't really need to change a whole lot. We can figure this out. We can, there'll, there'll be some technological fix. There'll be nuclear power. There'll be carbon capture. You know, there'll be electric everything. We don't really need to change anything significantly. Um, and then there are... Um, you know, what, um, I'm just looking here for a second, let me make sure I get the name right. Um, so Jenny Wade wrote a book, Changes of Mind, which describes these, these stages back in the 90s. And instead of postmodern, which has its own problem, she calls it affiliative consciousness, the stage affiliative consciousness. And of course, this is the stage, um, you know, where people are most concerned about climate change and really do feel this sense of doom and feel an incredible need to do something about it, you know, now. So then of course we know that there's the stage beyond first tier called integral and where integral has this capacity in many ways to have values that are similar to postmodern, but to engage with the other stages um, without hatred and without judgment, without any, you know, without the emotional display and that what came to me is that I wanted to write a book where I connected the common vision with the evolutionary paradigm 
and demonstrated to people that, um, you know, 20 years may seem like a long time, but right now, if we had, um, you know, 10 million families who began raising their children according to the common vision, um, in 18 years, we'd have, you know, 10 million more people in, in integral consciousness, and we might have a lever to move things along much more quickly. I mean, it, my belief is that it's al already happening. It's not dependent on, you know, on my work. Um, you know, it's, it's not dependent. I mean, the, the work of Sri Aurobindo and these folks transcends, you know, my little contribution. But I'm trying to make, I was trying to, I am trying to just make this more available to describe it for people. Because what I found in doing these workshops was that this description really helped people identify and commit to their own intuitive knowing and, and help them, you know, really sense that this was right, that they were right. You know, it wasn't, you know, what the grandmother said or whoever. I don't have to pick on the grandmother, um, you know. So that's, I think, the, 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 uh, the connection to evolution. I mean, you know, all of these three spiritual teachers wrote extensively and taught extensively about the evolution of consciousness. And it seems to me that, you know, we're engaged in a, in a kind of race right now. It's explicit. I mean, it's been there all along. But the explicit race is, um, you know, we need to evolve quickly enough so that, you know, we don't destroy the way in which we live. And for that matter, uh, you know, all these other creatures that we value or at least should value. So I, I, be I believe we have the capacity to do this. Um, and I believe, I mean, the, the irony of the situation, I think, is that, um, you know, we've created this tool, the Internet, that completely transcends um, the organizations, the institutions of the, you know, 19th century nation state, which are obviously nation states are completely outmoded. And if you want to get anything done, that matters. Um, and at the same time, the internet has also created this capacity uh, to enhance regression. And we see the regression in the United States and in Europe and, you know, elsewhere, you know, the, the internet is a powerful, powerful agent of regression. Um, but it's also a powerful, powerful agent of evolution. So this is the dance. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. Um, it seems like uh, in what you're saying, it seems as though I'm, I'm differentiating, like there's a the sort of a transhuman kind of relationship to technology, which is kind of putting all of its faith in this kind of place in which technology can can somehow solve problems some kind of a teleological kind of singularity that that technology is going to lead us somewhere and then on the other side you have kind of a post-humanism which i think is is exactly really where we're kind of what we're discussing is is has to do with um kind of a um a, a reimagining of those relationships with technology with other things like other organisms with the earth and such mm -hmm. Um, technology being an important part, but but not not the you know not the only um, attractor that's pulling us forward in the future. Um, and I think that both of these kinds of ways of looking at things, it really they they have different. Also, they assume different ways in which we understand ourselves as subjects. You know, and I think what I'm hearing in your when what you're saying, um, especially when you were bringing out that the kind of the older paradigm of like you, you break the will you subjugate the the will to rationality right mm -hmm. and so if we look at children from sort of a place of lack where they are overwhelmed by will and what we will sort of we will have to control that and then fill them with knowledge for instance right um mm -hmm. it just it seems like there's a lot of consequences that you know that you've been talking about that are not going to lead to this kind of a, a parenting you're not going to lead to a way of addressing some of the problems we're discussing and so this kind of an alternate pedagogy depends on how we look at subjectivity in general or consciousness you know and i guess my question is how it also it seems to me it also requires a different or an alternative habitus in the sense of 
having a, a, a theoretical idea of pedagogy um, is one thing, but how is that situated in the larger container, right? So in a classroom, for instance, um, or as a parent in your home where you have more of a controlled space, mm -hmm. um, then you, you have a lot more control. You can listen to the, let's say, the soul of the child and understand and know, know how to you know, create a different type of boundary than that of the container that they will encounter when they're out in public, for instance, or when they're, you know, interacting with, um, you know, like popular culture and stuff like that. And so it, yeah, that's, I guess that's just the question then again, in terms of what, um, how can we um, talk about parenting from this perspective and like what is that relationship then to the outside to the the cultural the greater cultural container which seems to be in many ways quite desold quite mm -hmm. you know um quite at odds with this kind of alternate habitus that we will also need in order to effectuate this um this type of pedagogy oh that's a good question yeah you know, I, I i have a um, comment about the transhumanist movement too but if you have time but i'll yeah, skip yeah. that for Sure, sure, sure. And let's come back to it. Um, okay. So I, I would um, I would take a step or two back. Um, so the 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 paradigm of school and all the accoutrements that come with it um, were really central to the whole modernist era. Um, you know the the way in which we understand and manifest. Um, the key elements of modernism, you know, so, you know, democracy and technology and science um, and industrialism, you know, wouldn't have existed without school because school is the training ground for all these, both good and bad, and, you know, whatever values you, you attach to any parts of it. Um, so all of the elements of school, uh, I would argue, need to be abandoned. And what we need, and, and again, um, this is not news. Um, um, you know, even Illich, are you familiar with Ivan Illich? You know, he was a, a Jesuit, I think it was a Jesuit. He was a Catholic philosopher in the 70s. And he wrote a series of books, um, basically uh, explaining the ways in which modernist institutions failed. So he started with a book called Deschooling, society, and then he wrote about our, um, our death care um, system um, and several others, I can't remember them all, but his final book was called Tools for Conviviality. And he had this guiding concept, conviviality, and he basically said, uh, well, what if we organize society based on convivial institutions? And so this would involve um, relationships of agreement, of mutual respect, of co you know, collective problem solving, and so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, uh, 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 he was on to um, integral consciousness. I mean, again, the terminology didn't exist, but if you go back and read him, um, that's clearly where he was coming from. So I would, I would argue, and I tried to display in the book, um, the practicalities of being a parent is that you don't get to in invent your own society. I mean, People do that, but that's a, most people don't want to do that. They don't want to go live off and, you know, aside from everything. And all the parents in the book lived in society. And I didn't, I didn't interview anybody, you know, who lived in a commune somewhere in the woods. That wasn't my point. So again, you're, you're always engaging with the dialectic. Um, I, you know, in my own uh, um, experience uh, as a step parent, um, my, my, uh, um, my former wife was a brilliant, um, uh, Sufi, um, school founder and, um, brilliant, brilliant parent and, um, engaged with her daughter. And, you know, in the time that I was involved, this was an ongoing dynamic of what is, what are the parts of the larger world that, um, you want your child to live in and what are the parts that you want to withhold from your child particularly at, at the particular ages um and i, I can give you a, a, a for, you know a great forbidden fruit story because you don't want to create forbidden fruit 
for your children because the forbidden fruit is a distorting. Uh, so um, when, when my then stepdaughter was, I think, six or seven, um, my, my ex-wife, wouldn't, she wouldn't take her to McDonald's. Like, it was just a step too far um, to go to. And so this was becoming, you know, like a forbidden fruit. Like, you know, everybody went to McDonald's in Greensboro, North Carolina. And, you know, even the, uh, the holistic ed kids went to McDonald's. When, so I, I was new on the scene and I said, all right, well, I'll take you to McDonald's, you know. So we went to McDonald's and, you know, got this hamburger. I, I mean, I ordered a hamburger, so we, I wasn't going to ever eat alone. And uh, so she like wolfed down the hamburger, like, you know, in three seconds. And okay. So then like a week later, she said, well, let's go back to McDonald's. And I said, all right, we'll go back to McDonald's. So this time she, taste, she started tasting the hamburger. And, um, you know, she had a couple of bites and she said, this isn't very good. And I said, yeah, it, it isn't really, I mean, we have better, you know, we weren't, we weren't in the vegetarian stage yet. That came a few months later. And I, she said, we have better hamburgers at home. And I said, yeah, absolutely. You know, we did, you know, so that's a, a little example of a dialectic. Um, and again, I, I'm not saying that my, my ex-wife's judgment was wrong. Um, you know, she, she, I, I didn't do this contrary to her. She just said, she just said, I can't stand it. <laughs> I said, all right, I'll do it. So anyway, um, you know, parenting gets really complex, particularly if you have two parents, because you have to then get, you have to get agreement to a large extent. Um, but, you know, so this is a, a, it's a dialectic, it's a negotiation, it's a consciousness. And again, what I illustrate in the book with these interviews is that these parents were engaged in this all the time. Um, another story, one of the stories in the book was, um, that also illustrates this. Um, so these were uh, uh, girls who went to Waldorf school. And one of the common things in Waldorf school was that, um, you know, by eighth grade, um, the kids, they, they just wanted, they couldn't wait to get out of Waldorf school. Like they felt, you know, constrained because, you know, it was so weird. And they wanted to get out in the real world. And I, I'll take that story in a second where it goes. But this particular, um, you know, uh, youth, um, you know, she wanted to go to the mall. She was like 14. She wanted to go to the mall and like, you know, try out some different stuff. And, um, and her mom hated going to the mall. She hated the mall. The mall gave her headaches. But... She said, I went to the mall with my daughter because it was important for me to stay in contact with her. And, you know, I think that's a really great insight um, into the dialectic, which is there are times when you do things with and for your child. So you stay in contact with their reality, their consciousness, uh, particularly if they invite you, that you would never do by yourself. Um, and it's not a sacrifice. It's a, it's, it's part of the deal. I would argue it's part of the quality of parenting of being, you know, it, it's great that you got invited to go. And, um, so there's a whole series of stories like that in the book where parents, you know, and sometimes they describe things that they did that didn't work, you know, um, I mean, that's, you know, not, uh, some things didn't work. Some things failed. Some things went wrong. Right. And um, does, that, does that answer the question? And the... Yeah, I know. Thank you very much. Um, it like definitely it sounds as though that the need for uh, kind of a co-creativity or a, a transformation with the child is, is a lot different than, than saying now you go and do this um, activity or you mm -hmm. do this and you transform, but I do my own, you know, I, I work in my own circles, but <laughs> yeah. That makes, well, this that makes is, a lot um, I mean, I mean, one of my other obs obsessions is, is this, um, is that adolescence is a category error. It's a misunderstanding of human potential. Um, adolescence was invented in 1904. Um, I'm not going to remember his name. He was a, the preeminent psychologist in the United States. He was the founder of Clark University, the president of Clark University. He wrote this enormous tome about it, he invented the term adolescence and wrote this enormous tome about it. Um, but the thing was the only population that he drew on 
um, were college students in Clark University in the 1890s. Um, so these were all male. And there were only two kinds of um, boys, young men who went to college in the, in the 1890s in the United States, the, the children of the ruling class or people who were, wanted to become ministers. So this, is, this, was his, you know, this was his research population that he drew on. And um, this I actually describe in the, in the booklet, um, inviting youths to claim the power of their imaginations. But the very short version of it was, um, this meme was put out, and again, you can look up this guy's name. I'm not gonna take the time to look it up. Um, it was a very powerful flag in the culture. Um, he was a, a significant player in the intellectual culture at the time. And um, what was happening was that there were these two forces coming together. One force was child labor laws. So presumably this was a positive thing to get children out of the factory, to get teens, out, adolescent youth out of the factory um, because they were being abused. But the other part of this dynamic of this um, was that there were too many immigrants. And in order to create jobs for all these immigrants, remember between 1890 and 1920, um, the population of immigrants in the United States was the highest it ever, well, even higher than now. And these immigrants were all these, you know, damn foreigners from Italy and Greece and Russia and Poland and, you know, whatever, you know, I mean, immigrants have always been seen as for. You, you hopefully can tell that I'm being facetious here. Um, so, you know, I mean, the Irish were the first immigrants, so, uh, anyway. So um, they need to get the youths out of the factory, out of jobs, because they needed the jobs for the adults. So basically what they came up with was this idea that everybody should go to high school. But you've been to high school, high school doesn't work for the majority of the population very well. Um, and this notion that, um, you know, you've got to spend all this time preparing for your life afterwards doesn't resonate very much with adolescents either, with youth either. Um, and the final thing, and I could go on, I'll, I'll stop in a minute here, but the final uh, irony is that Homo sapiens has been around for, you know, they've upped the total now to 300,000 years, 310,000 years. They found some Homo sapiens 300,000 years. Um, but with the full cognitive lobes, the mental structure and all that, so we're still 55,000 years. So for 54,000 and 900 of those years, um, you know, human beings went through puberty and they became adults. Now, some of them lived in very complex cultures. Um, you know, they got married, they had children, they became warriors, they became artisans. Some of them became kings. I mean, you know, but they, there was no sense that, oh, you're 15, you can't participate. And so we invented this in the 20th century. Um, you know, one psychologist invented it. We wanted to get these youths out of the factory. Uh, what did we do? We stuck them all in high school. And then we invented youth culture to make it even worse. So give them a separate culture. Um, you know, and, and the technology, of, I, I can't resist. There's one more story about this I, I love to tell. So, um, you know, when I was, uh, so I was born in 1949 and uh, the transistor was invented, I believe in 1953 or 54. Um, so the first application of the transistor in for commercial, uh, you know, uh, use was radios. And transistor radios were maybe this size, you know, and um, the one that I bought cost $10, which was a lot of money for a, you know, a nine-year-old kid. It would be like the equivalent of $100 now. So I saved up my school banking and my, you know, my allowance and the money I made for, you know, uh, mowing the lawn, you know, for about eight months to get one of these. And, um, but the transformation was prior to these radios, the radio was something that sat in the living room um, it was essentially the size, you know, close to being the size of a washing machine. Um, and you listen to it with the family. Kids didn't have their own radios that they could put under their pillows um, and listen to, um, you know, African-American blues 
um, at three in the morning, like I did, you know, or whatever. So this created the transistor and the transistor radio, along with the uh, long playing record, then created, you know, the first access to youth culture, the separate culture, um, which again is just, you know, except for moments, I mean, clearly there are moments in with the youth culture, you know, evolved consciousness and, uh, you know, um, I would still argue that, you know, two of the most effective uh, populists for new consciousness um, in the mid 20th century were John Lennon and George Harrison, uh, because they had access to this enormous audience. And um, if you listen to John Lennon's song, Imagine, um, you know, you couldn't find a better anti-patriotism song, anti-nationalism song. And Harrison really opened up the door to, you know, Eastern spirituality, uh, which he doesn't get credit for. I, I should write a book. People have written books about it. And, but anyway, so I'll just stop at that point. But the thing, you know, we, we, one of the most powerful needs we have in this century um, is to re-engage youth with adult culture and, and respect their capacities, respect their vision, respect their imagination. Um, and recognize that, that it's also in many ways young, <laughs> you know, if they don't know everything, yeah, no kidding. We don't know everything either. So, and that's what the, my, my, uh, do a little plug here. My little booklet, um, is about, this can is you, on Amazon. So people can you read it. the title for us? Sure. Inviting youths to claim the power of their imaginations, a guidebook. And I'm also happy to send the PDF of this to anybody, you know, without charge. Um, anybody would like it. So anybody who see who see who listens to this, uh, send me an email, david.marshak at gmail.com, and I'd be happy to send you. And I could would also send you a PDF of the evolutionary book, too. You don't need to buy it. I don't need the money. I mean, I'd take it, but I don't need it. So <laughs> very generous. Anyway, thank you. It, it's um you know, the potential, and again, what, what, say one more thing. I mean, what really got me excited about doing this was I, you know, I, I, I was listening to Greta Thunberg five years when, when she first emerged. And, um, you know, of course I was blown away. I mean, what an incredible fullness of understanding and capacity to articulate that understanding. And then I had this second thought, I said, you know, this young woman is not unique. She's wonderful, but she's not the only one. So I went looking, um, and I, so in this pamphlet, I, uh, guidebook, um, I have little bios and pictures of about 20, uh, you know, folks under the age of 19 who are engaged in changing the world. And I, and I could do another with another 20 or 50 or 100, you know, and, you know, I, I got tired of putting them up on my website. Um, so I stopped, you know, for a while anyway, but you start looking at people under 20, uh, and in their early twenties, and there are many, many of them all over the planet. And again, the key is they have access. They have access to information. They have access to knowledge. They have access to publication. They have access to finding each other. And these are all key. I mean, none of this existed, you know, in the 1960s, when I was, uh, in this age, we had a flowering of consciousness and there was an energetic in the planet, but we had no way of connecting with people in, you know, in different countries. Um, even telephoning was, was really expensive. Um, and certainly travel, nobody had money, you know, it was expensive to travel and there wasn't any kind of immediacy, you know, it's like the French kids did their thing and the Germans did their thing. The Czechs did their thing. The people in the U.S. did their thing. The Canadians did their thing, um, but it was all separate. It was. It, I would argue, and many people have, it was the same energetic. Yeah, indeed. I think it, it, that's what I like of, of you that you put things, very diverse things together. And then come to the final conclusion, it's same energetics or very similar energetics. You, you, you already said this at the beginning. Uh, uh, 
we are talking of very different personalities who see the same thing or similar things in from different point of points of view mm -hmm. and what you're doing here is seeing things integrally integrally mm -hmm. and, and that's what we are trying to do here also uh, mm -hmm. bring forward a sort of integral message mm -hmm. yeah yeah I, I, I love that uh, but yeah so without spoiling too much the article of the journal uh, um, because so that who is viewing this can just read your article which is a wonderful article you already mm -mm, touched on this uh, aspect now uh, but if you can develop it a bit more how do you see this now recent uh, very modern movement of uh, ecological consciousness uh, how do you relate this to the evolution of consciousness to education to parenting to everything what you have said so far because you make a connection with a pretty technical aspect of your of our, our life and here we already spoke about it it's it's uh, there we feel i think we already said all three here we pointed out that seeing things only from the technological point of view is not enough mm -hmm. technology will help us is necessary to solve some problems but if we see things too much from this point of view it's it will not lead us to the real solution and yeah and it, and, and how is this vision of ecological consciousness different from the ecological concept that we have today still probably or the past uh, ecological consciousness and how this relates to education the soul the psychic being parenting and all these things well that's a big question <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, you know, here's here's what I would say to that. And so my particular capacity at this at the age I'm at now is I think I'm pretty good at describing um, the way in which the teachings offer uh, an evolutionary way forward for us. I'm pretty good at describing what the particular teachings are and, and um, how they're available. And, and I think it's particularly um, the concept that the kind of vision starts with this very simple and very profound perception and conception of human existence and of human potential. Um, I have ideas about what's happening in the world. And so, for example, the notion that there are young people uh, under the age of 20 who are, you know, really beginning to take up the responsibility and leadership um, for the kind of evolution that needs to happen for us to, um, you know, create a sustainable and at least relatively just society. I'm not a, I don't expect perfection, but I think we could do a lot better if we had, you know, a greater percentage of people um, who are engaging in leading the society and organizing the society from integral consciousness. We could do a whole lot better. Um, and we have the capacity to do that. Uh, but beyond that, I would have to say that, you know, I really don't know what's going to happen. And I think it's important, um, you know, one, one of the phenomena that I see going on, um, particularly in the United States, but I don't know enough if it's going on elsewhere. Um, but, it, you know, it just really seems, um, and I'm grasping here for the adjective, um, I don't know, odd, strange, bizarre, um, the United States, we have the oldest Congress we've ever had. We have the oldest president 
we've ever had, you know, in 200 and how many years. And, um, and these guys, these guys and women, they're not even boomers. They're like pre-boomers. <laughs> but I think it's an issue with boomers as well, which is, you know, I have a really clear sense of that it's time to hand over leadership to younger people. And in fact, it's really critical that we do that. And yet that doesn't seem, I seem to be uh, in the minority. Um, you know, for just one, one specific example, uh, Pat Leahy, who is the senior senator for Vermont, who's been senator for 50 years, which of course is a whole other problem, you know, is retiring, announced his retirement, he's 82. And uh, um, I think his first name, Welch, I can't think of his name, Mr. Welch Cohn, who's the single Congress member from Vermont, uh, is 74. He's been in Congress for 30 years. And he just announced that he's going to run for the Senate at 74. It's like there's no sense of limits that's appropriate to the need for evolution. Um, and, I, you know, it's very clear to me that I don't know what's happening. I mean, I used to think I knew, you know, if you, if you talked to me 25 years ago, I would tell you what I thought was happening in the world. And, it, you know, I may not have been right, but I had a sense of what, what was happening that I could articulate. And it's very clear to me now that I don't know what's happening in the world. And I don't, I'm not going to pretend that I know. Um, I believe that there, you know, again, that there is this evolutionary energy and I could show you examples of it. Um, and clearly there is this regressive energy that's manifesting as well. And I think that it, it's, these are both happening together for a good, for a reason, because this is the dynamic, the dynamic of evolution um, is that when you threaten the existing norms, the existing norms try to hold on. They resist change. And that's exactly what's going on, particularly in the United States, but, you know, elsewhere as well. And it may not be as dramatic. Um, you know, for one thing I, you know, I will say that about something I don't know, but I perceive, you know, I think it's really interesting that, um, you know, both in Russia and China, you see, um, societies where uh, that had tolerated a certain amount of personal space and a certain amount of, um, you know, kind of social activity, um, you know, both of these have essentially are moving beyond authoritarianism or totalitarian societies at the same time. And again, it would seem to me that this is an example of defensiveness. I mean, it doesn't mean that the Chinese Communist Party is going to be overthrown tomorrow. Um, but uh, to my, in my mind, the evolutionary model is that when the homeostasis tries to defend itself more and more, it weakens itself in the process. And ultimately, as it weakens itself, it opens up the possibility for the new norm to emerge. Um, so it's an incredibly complex time. And as I say, I don't, even, even what I just said about these two societies, you know, I don't really know. I mean, it's just my perception of the data as I, as I read it and read and hear about it. You know, the one thing I, I'm going to take the opportunity of, since, I, since there will be an audience for this, um, you know, what I'm actually looking for is, is, um, I'm looking for a young colleague, or in some sense, a successor. I feel like this is a lineage. You know, I was called to this lineage to do this work uh, 40, you know, two years ago. And I think I've done this work reasonably well. And, um, but I've never been particularly good. I'm not a promoter. You know, I mean, I can speak publicly, I can do, but um, in, in the current uh, world of the internet, you know, of, of social media um, and blogs and all this stuff, you know, this is not something I want to do because 
it's just, it's just not who I am. I'm not, I, you know, when I've tried to do it, I'm not good at it. I'm not called to do it. I don't have passion for it. Um, so I'm actually looking for a successor in this lineage. So if you know anybody who's interested, they should get in touch with me because there's an enormous potential to bring this teaching, you know, out into the world. Um, and there's enormous potential that could come from it for someone who's called to this work because it's not my work. You know, it's, it's, it's a piece of work that was given to me um, that I've engaged in because of the sense of calling. Um, so I'm hoping there's someone else who's called to do this. You know, that would be my, uh, my, that's, you know, I'm putting out the vibe in place, any place I can. So. Yeah, beautiful. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. I'm sure your, your call will be answered in various ways. And I think mm -hmm. that, um, you know, as I've gotten to, um, to be able to work on the collaboration board and it seems as though that, you know, there's, there is a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, beautiful, you know, energetics and vision in, in, you know, continuing furthering this kind of integral paradigm. And, um, it's, I just wanted to, I, I just want to, I guess, voice, like, respond to what you were saying a little bit, because I love, um, you know, you bringing out all of the young people that are engaged in change and in mm -hmm. really challenging kind of the, 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 let's say the normative kind of barriers that, that, that have sort of been imposed and, and challenging them, asking bigger questions. You mentioned uh, mm -hmm. Greta and climate change for me has always been one of the most challenging to confront because it seems in my lifetime um, that it, it's the narrative is, is it's on this kind of this bell curve that is exponentially, you know, working against us, you know, and that to me has always been really challenging to confront how that, that has been sort of unfolding in my life. And um, I guess I definitely don't doubt that there's, there's a lot of people who are engaged in the, in a transformation of consciousness um, like we're speaking about, but it also seems like you're saying there's a regressive volume uh, um, potential as well that's working. And, you know, Sri Aurobindo would talk about like the hour of the gods, that, that kind of rupture point when, mm -hmm. when, you know, when there's, there's, there's sort of, you know, like this war that the devas and the Asuris, Asuras are, 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 you know, basically fighting over this kind of evolutionary urge. Mm -hmm. And, you know, where and how, what are the conditions of this rupture and, and how, how will it, what will it look like? And are we going to be ready for that? And I just sometimes feel that that's, that concerns me because if one side becomes overpowering, you know, and this would be more of the, the ways in which when I was younger without, I, I engage in activism, but I burnt out very quickly because mm -hmm. I, I said, I have to take care of myself because this is, I can't engage in this. I don't have the strength. I don't know how to face this. And so I, I ended up, um, that's when I went to India. I went to learn music there. I lived there for 10 years, but I also took up uh, learning music as integral yoga from my guru there. Mm -hmm. And, and so when I came back after living there, I felt like with, with a kind of a spiritual foundation of practice, I'm sort of re confronting these, these questions, but I'm recently, the reason I wanted to bring this up is I'm recently reading this book here. I'll show it because we have the video here. This is a Bernard Stiegler, who's one of the postmodern, uh, sorry, uh, post human thinkers. He just recently passed mm -hmm. away. It's called the age of disruption, technology and madness in computational capitalism. And it's, it's, it's very uh, distressing to read because what he's saying, and again, he may be thinking beyond our immediate time, but it's, it's, he's, he's understanding that we're sort of the, the generations now they're the first generations that are not inheriting a future. And when he means future, they're not, they're not given, we're not giving them the kind of the tools to be able to create a future because they're the potential that create, you know, like this kind of conscious potential is becoming in lack in a way because of, the type of bell curve we're, we're, we're facing, let's say, for instance, in terms of the climate, you know, it's hard to imagine a future when you look at certain statistics. And so it's, 
the cultural and like you could say the psychic material of this potential is really important, you know, to provide, because I, I see like, the, let's say young people have that vision, have that, um, that inspiration, have the imagination, but how long will they be able to sustain a fight and not see enough change if the institutions, and like you're saying, if the institutions, the corporations mm -hmm. are not going to hand over a power, open up to other possibilities. And so I guess that's where it's like the construction of a vision for the future is really what it seems to be, you know, where, where that's where the war is, you know, for me. And I guess I just wanted the, the that's sort of a, just a response, not, not a question as much, but I'm a musician and I just wanted to ask you the role of the arts in your, in your, your work and in education and in integral parenting, evolutionary parenting. And I just wanted to, you to respond to the importance and the role of the arts. Okay, I'll, I'll respond to that, but I also want to respond to what you also just sure, said sure. as well. Sure, sure, please, please. Arts. Um, I mean, I can respond to that, you know, very simply and directly, which is that, um, you know, the, the arts, people who are called to the arts, everybody should be exposed to the arts, people are called to the arts, should be supported. Um, one of the great insights uh, of Steiner in the, in the Waldorf School is that you don't need to be gifted to play musical instruments or make beautiful pictures. I mean, you know, one of the, the uh, qualities um, that really distinguishes the Waldorf curriculum is that everybody plays music and everybody make, makes beautiful pictures. And you see that, you know, by the time you get to Waldorf High School, there are differentiations in how skilled people are or how creative people are, but they're all, capable of, of a kind of a certain level of comfort and creation. They can all play musical instruments. They can all, you know, create beautiful pictures. Um, you know, so it, it's really, again, a notion of, of in seeing the arts in children's lives, particularly, it's not a sorting experience. It's not looking for gifts. It's engaging everybody and, um, you know, I mean, uh, once one little story I can share, I, I spent a year, uh, and I described this in the first book, The Common Vision, um, as a volunteer teacher's aide in the second grade in the Waldorf School in the Boston area. And uh, I was there for, uh, you know, one day a week originally, and then two days a week, and then three days a week. And uh, then the teacher got sick. And so I was the sub for a couple of weeks, which was a lot of fun. And, but one of the things in second grade is that, is that, you know, everybody starts playing, I think they start in first grade, but they're beginning to get good playing these little wooden flutes. Um, and so the, the kids taught me how to play the flute, you know, and they thought it was really funny that I couldn't play, you know, like they were all better. The worst of them was better than I was. And, and, you know, it was like, cause I didn't, you know, I, I grew up in a school system where, you know, you didn't get access to this at a time when um, you didn't realize that there were people who were good at it and people weren't good at it. You know, it was just something that everybody did. So uh, as I say, you know, I would encourage parents and any kind of um, organized learning, um, you know, particularly that the arts is an enormous part. And again, then you get into the, the you know, the stage, uh, you know, in childhood, which is the, the you know, the second stage, um, you know, from six or seven, been up to you know beginning of adolescence when the you know one of the key uh you know developmental desires is to become competent you know in the world in the material world and so the arts are a really big part of that um and again this is something that the Walder school does well because they integrate you know all of the sensory development um you know with mathematics with the arts um in activities that kids do every day and enjoy and play and play you know and but again particularly you know in, in grades one through four or five every day kids do stuff where they integrate the arts mathematics kinesthetics um, aesthetics movement so yeah absolutely um and you know and again i think we would have a really different um We'd have a different adult culture, you know, if we had a kind of a universal experience of being comp being capable in some art forms, you know, for all children.
so the, the future, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, and again, so I don't know, I'm, you know, but one example I can speak to. So uh, I, if you're, you're familiar with the Sunrise Movement, Jonathan, no, okay. No, no, so, no please. So the Sunrise Movement is a, uh, an organization in the United States um, was started by several women in their late teens. I think they're six or seven years older now. But basically, it's, it was organized um, um, for people in their teens and early 20s uh, as a climate change um, pressure group. So kids pressuring adults. And like one of the great moments of the early Sunrise Movement um, was that they took some middle school kids, five or six of them, and um, uh, set up a, a conversation with Diane Feinstein. So Diane Feinstein is a senior senator from California. Uh, she just got herself reelected uh, two years ago at the age of 82. Um, she's been in office for 40 years. Um, so these, these middle school uh, youths um, confronted her about how come you're not doing more about climate change? And, um, and she went to this, you know, you don't know enough to question me position. Um, and the kids called her on that and, you know, they basically said, you know, well, you'll be dead. You know, why are you screwing up the world for us? <laughs> it was like, you can find this online. If you Google sunrise movement and Diane Feinstein, it, I, I'm sure it's still there. And I may be exaggerating a little bit, but, you know, it was a great paradigm moment of, you know, of young people calling out the responsibility. Diane Feinstein has a lot of power. You know, she's a committee chair. I don't know which one, but she's, a, you know, been there forever. And um, so the Sunrise Movement, you know, I think they expected that they, you know, they'd organize for five or six years and change the world. Um, and they didn't. So now they're moving into electoral politics because they understand that they've got to change the people in the government. So um, how long will they be at it? I don't know, but they just started, you know. They've just started working on it. And, and the, pra the practical term is that you've got to change the people in the government. And, um, you know, the good news is a lot of the old folks are going to die. So, you know, that's going to happen. But on the other hand, the extension of lifespan that we're experiencing now is the reason that we have all these people older than I am who are still in these positions of power who don't have the grace, you know, to step aside. I mean, for me personally, uh, you know, I absolutely would not want to be in charge of anything now because it's just so inappropriate in terms of the evolution of consciousness. I mean, I have a role. I, I want, I'm an elder. I want to be in a, I'm a pretty good elder and I want to get better at it. Um, and elders, the one thing we have now that we didn't have in the 60s is that we have a lot of elders, which is good, I think. But the elders shouldn't be running things. Um, they should be elders. Elders are you know, are available for advice and for, you know, help, you know, when they're asked. <laughs> so. Beautiful, beautiful words. I, I, I like this very much, especially this last part, because it reminds me also a bit, I don't know if I'm romanticizing because I have no direct contact with them, but it reminds, it reminds me also a bit, um, um, the Aboriginal culture, the, the how do you say, the, um, ah, <laughs> I don't, the words then don't come, but you know, the, um, the native, native, native cultures, Native mm -hmm. American, for example, that of the Native American culture, where the role of the elders has meaning. And, and even in that context, so here we see, we get the connection of the dots. Uh, uh, they have also special uh, perception of nature and the, the ecology and these things. So but this is again, would bring us also even much beyond where we are now. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think it's wonderful listening to you. It's really, and, and I have this feeling that you project us into the future. Well, so I, I like that. 
I mean, I want to just if I could share one more anecdote about the, the elders. And um, yeah. this, this is also in the in the guidebook, but I think it's really in, in so one of the elders who was around in the 1960s and understood what was happening um, was Margaret Mead. And Margaret Mead was a um, you know, very well-known anthropologist. She was one of the people who really invented anthropology in the 1920s. And um, she had many other successful and important roles in American culture in mid-century. And in her final book uh, that she wrote uh, in the published in the 70s, Culture and Commitment, um, she said there, there, there are three kinds of societies where you have a relationship between the young and the old. And that, you know, for almost all of human history, the old people knew more than the young people because things didn't change. And again, if you go back 300,000 years or 50,000 years, you know, things, things didn't change much until, you know, the last couple of thousand years. Um, so, you know, that made sense. And then she said, uh, then I, I don't, she has labels for this, which I don't remember exactly. So I'm not going to try because again, it's in the pamphlet. Um, she said, well, then, you know, really beginning around 1800, things began to change. And, um, you know, I think in our time, it's, um, it's easy to forget how dramatic the changes were. So for example, in, in my parents' lifetime, um, so they experienced the, the uh, universalization of radio. So radio was as transformative in the culture as the internet, because all of a sudden you could hear people talking who weren't in your house or your village. And, you know, it would transform. Uh, I mean, Hitler would not have existed without radio. Franklin Roosevelt would not have existed without radio. These are the, the two world leaders who understood intuitively in the 1930s that radio allowed them to have a personal connection with the populace in the same way that Trump figured out that Twitter allowed him to have a personal connection with the populace. And, you know, people still haven't acknowledged how important, I mean, Twitter was essential, it's essential to Trump. And if he gets it back again, it'll be essential again. Um, so what, what she said was that really beginning in the 19th century and then taking off in the 20th century as things accelerated, um, we really began to have a separation between the young and the old and they had different experiences because the young tended to take the new technologies for granted and for the old, they were transformative and revolutionary and many times um, not wanted. You know, they, they would transform lives in a negative way. Um, and that in some ways reached a peak, she said, in the 1960s when, you know, we had um, this radical disjunction between the young and the old. And it featured uh, adolescence as being, you know, this in time of intense, um, you know, violence emotional violence, physical violence, um, and which is certainly not necessarily ne needed in adolescence. So what she said is that we need to evolve, recognizing that change will continue, we need to evolve to a third position, um, which we have to some extent, I think, but need to do a lot more. And that is um, that the older folks recognize that young people perceive the present in ways that are more accurate than the old folks because they don't bring 30 or 40 or 50 years of personal history to the perception and conception because you know reality we're always we're always conceiving reality i mean we don't it's not just we see it and it's there you know we're always seeing it through the filter or consciousness and um if the old folks recognize that there is a val a particular value in the perception and conception of the young um, and acknowledge that as being valuable to them in terms of seeing what's going on in the world um, and express that, then the young people will want to engage the old folks in, you know, how do you see this? And, and how does this feel in your life? And how does this compare to when you were young? And how do you make, you know, that there will be that these two different roles, but they require mutual respect, but the respect has to start with the old folks um, because the young are, I don't know, are inevitably touchy. You know, what can we say? You know, you're coming into these realizations for the first time 
you know, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, you're really making sense of the world for the first time. And, um, you know, you don't want some old fart coming in and telling you you're wrong. So I think that's a really important understanding also of the, you know, of the generational potential, the potential um, between elders and the young is, you know, is really powerful, but it requires a particular kind of dance. Exactly. And it's, it's, it, in fact, it's a dance between two poles, so to speak, uh, and no pole of these two dancing subjects is inessential, but they have two different roles, two mm -hmm. different places in society. We cannot just inter interchange them. Yeah, I love this. this. This is a very profound argument. And by the way, since we are speaking about souls, we could also speak about uh, um, young and old souls, mm -hmm. because we are now speaking about our bodies, uh, the elder, elder in the sense of our bodily years. But there is also, I, I think I perceive it's an intuitive feeling of young and old souls and sometimes you can find also old souls in young bodies right? mm -hmm. uh, and vice versa so, so okay yeah so it, it's a wonderful discussion i could go on and on for hours <laughs> with these sort of things but i see that we have now about one hour and 40 minutes almost and so i think we mm -hmm. slowly wrap it up and come to a conclusion you already told us about how eventually people can contact you and you already said can you repeat the, the email eventually? sure uh, it's my name david dot marshak m-a-r-s-h-a-k at gmail.com yeah. and i'm you know i'm always happy to to hear from people to meet new people and as i said i'd be happy to send pdfs of these various publications um yeah, yeah so thank you this has really been yeah and i mean it's been enjoyable for me i like talking what can i say but um also really really interesting i really appreciate your questions and i appreciate the opportunity to talk about them so thank you yeah thank you thank you, you. Oh, thank mm -hmm. you yeah. and we'll look forward to uh another maybe another publication and collaboration in the future <laughs> Yeah. Well, maybe we'll see i yeah. have to get inspired so that's the thing i was inspired with that piece so great Thanks. Yeah. Take care. Yeah. Nice to meet you, Jonathan. Thank you. Okay. Thank nice you. To meet you, you as well. Marco again. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you. Bye bye.